before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time that we have to study here today. Um, we're thankful for the studies of this past week, uh, the way that you have led and guided. We ask for your continued um, direction as we open your word together. We know, Lord, that there's much that we do not understand and that we ask that you can enlighten our minds and correct any errors we may have in our understanding. I pray that you can be with each person in the trials that they face each day. And we just ask, Lord, that, um, uh, the, that the truths that we study will encourage and strengthen us and help us to reflect your character to those around us. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, well, good morning again. Now, this is the last study this week, and we're going to begin looking at this chronology of the decrees. Now, I mean, there's so many things that we could do, and the one thing we're not going to do is we're not going to go through Leviticus 26 and the four seven times and, and all of that because I've done many other studies on it. But we need to be aware that these three decrees end periods of uh, chastisement that God establishes in Leviticus 26. So um, when we look here, for instance, this is in Second Chronicles, um, and it's going to talk about what happens under Zedekiah. So it's going to say that you know Zedekiah he became king, he rebelled against. Uh, Jerusalem, we're not getting Jerusalem against Babylon. Um, and then because of that, um, Babylon is going to come and destroy Jerusalem. And it says in verse 17, therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees. So that's Nebuchadnezzar, right? Chaldees are just another name for the Babylonians, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age, gave them all into his hand. And they burnt the house of God and break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. So the first thing we see is it talks about the destruction of Jerusalem, and um, and then it's going to talk about how the Israelites, the Jews, are going to be servants to Nebuchadnezzar and his sons, which just refers not necessarily to his literal sons or descendants because they actually don't rule, uh, but to the ones that follow after him, that is the kings of Babylon. And this is going to be until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. And it says to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. So, so this is referring to a prophecy in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 25. And 29 that deals with the 70 years until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. Now, that word there, Sabbaths, um, you can see is this 7676, right? Um, that's the common word often for Sabbath. This word, Sabbath, um, occurs 107 times in the Bible. So I always thought that was interesting uh, in Strong's. So that's the 10th day of the seventh month as a symbol. It's also the last four digits on my phone number, 7676. So, um, so kind of interesting there. Now we have this word uh, Sabbath that is 7673. And that's more that to keep rest. So when you have the word Sabbath, it usually refers either to the seventh day Sabbath, like in Exodus 16, 23. 
um, when it talks about the Sabbath. This is the rest of the Holy Sabbath. So that's referring to the seventh day Sabbath. When it says the land kept Sabbath, that's just the Hebrew word, which means to rest or to cease, desist. And um, now the fulfilling of the three score and 10 years then is the 70 years that the land has to rest. And then it's going to say in the next two verses, uh, referring to Cyrus. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given to me, and he hath charged me to build him an house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him and let him go up. So this is the decree or the proclamation, as it says here, of Cyrus. And this is going to end the 70 years that the land rests. Now, in verse 21 of 2 Chronicles 36, where it's going to quote Leviticus 26, it's going to quote Leviticus 26, verse 34 and 35. So I'm just going to quickly go there. So then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths, as long as she lay desolate and ye be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest. You can see that same word, 7673. And enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest. Because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when ye dwelt upon it. So the suggestion here is that the 70 years occurs in Second Chronicles 36, it's going to be 70 years. And that's based upon the fact that there needs to be 70 Sabbaths of years that the land did not rest. So in 490 years, there is 70 sabbatical years. And so that since the land didn't rest in those years, it's now going to rest for 70 years. So that's one of the keys that we could take the 490 years and place it in 1097 BC. That would be when Saul becomes king. So I'm not going to go into the whole, uh, how, how that was all figured out, but when we worked out the chronology of the kings of Judah and Israel, or at least when I did, I came to the conclusion that Saul was anointed in 1097. And that fit perfectly with the 490 years ending in 607 when Daniel is taken captive. So it's Daniel's captivity that marks the end of the 70 years of the land resting. Now, remember in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel is going to inquire about the 70 years, right? So in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus. So this is two years. Well, it's really about a year and a half before Cyrus comes to the throne. So this is in the spring, supposedly in the spring or sometime in that first year after the spring of 538. Right. So we know that Babylon fell. Cyrus conquers it in October 13th, 539. And the first year of Darius does not begin until the spring. So we're just assuming that this is the first year uh, in the spring, so early after the first year. And Daniel is going to be seeking God because he knows that there are 70 years in Jeremiah that are mentioned. So he wants to know what those, to understand those 70 years. And so he's going to understand by books, right? So uh, Sephardim. That is uh, books or writings, the number of the years. And so that means it's not just the book of Jeremiah. He would be looking at the book of Leviticus as well. So he would be studying Leviticus 26. And we know that because of Daniel 9 verse 11, where he uses a, a play on words. Um, 
So he says, yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey the, thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon them. And the oath, so that's the word seven times, that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. So when he refers to this oath or the seven times, it's a, a play on words relating to the seven times of Leviticus 26. So the Sheba there in Leviticus 26. Um, and, and of course, he's also fulfilling the conditions that are laid out in Leviticus 26. So he obviously knows about Leviticus 26, not just the book of Jeremiah. So in Jeremiah 25, and we talked about this before in other studies in much more detail, but we're just kind of skimming over these. Um, it's going to talk about this 70 years. And that's Jeremiah 25, verse 11. Um, it says, and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years and it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation said the Lord for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans will I make it perpetual desolations. So we know that that's going to be when Babylon falls to Cyrus, well, to Darius the Mede, who is the king of Media and Cyrus his general. So Cyrus is going to come in and conquer Babylon, he's going to put to death Belshazzar. So we're going to look at that. But uh, that's the 70 years for Babylon. In Jeremiah 29, uh, we're going to also run into 70 years, but this is not the same period of 70 years. So in verse 10, it says, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. So this is not um, the 70 years that end in 539. This is the 70 years that end in 537, two years later, when Cyrus comes to the throne. And when those 70 years end, then God will visit them and perform his good word toward them in causing them to return to this place. So this happens at the end of the 70 years at Babylon, right? So that's where Daniel is um, in Daniel chapter 10, right? So in Daniel chapter 10, the reason he's playing, playing, praying in Daniel chapter 10 is he's in the third year of Cyrus, that is the third year from the fall of Babylon. And he knows that the 70 uh, years are completed, but he still, the, the decree is not gone for. He's also, I believe, my understanding is he's shown these proofs, these verses in Isaiah, talking about Cyrus, I surname thee, right? Even, before, even though thou did not know me, right? So before he was born, he was given this name, Cyrus. And um, so Daniel is praying and fasting because he wants this decree to come from Cyrus. And at the end of this 21 days, the angel Gabriel comes in Christ and he's going to be given uh, the information that this decree has been issued. That's what we're, we believe is implied here. So the reason why he has to wait 21 days is because that's how long it takes for Cyrus to make the decree. A decision to issue this decree and so it would be on the day that he issued the decree now somebody had written me in um, uh, in facebook messenger and asked about uh, why i don't use the 24th day of the seventh month but it kind of puzzled me a little bit um so they were trying to line this up with solomon uh the 24th day of the seventh month dealing with the dedication of the temple um, but never is the, the seventh month ever referred to as the first month. So when it says the four and 20th day of the first month there in Daniel 10, verse four, that's never referring to the first month in the fall. Even if you have 
the start of the year being in the fall, it's still referred to as the seventh month. Now, the Babylonians did not number their months, and the Jews only did after um, they, they were given the start of the year by Moses in 1533 BC. So, so the Babylonians are always just going to give the month name. They don't have a start of the year per se. I mean, they do have a religious calendar that begins in the spring and ends in the fall, just as the Jews do. So they have a counterfeit of the Jewish um, feasts called the Akitu Festival, which is in the spring and the fall, um, with the first and the seventh month, just like the Jews do with Passover and then the, the Day of Atonement and Feast of Tabernacles. So they have something very similar. But um, they don't uh, count the months that way. So, so, the, so even if you're using a Babylonian calendar, uh, you're not going to count the month. So only if, if you number the month as the first month, you know it's a biblical calendar first month, unless you are counting it you know, from some other event. But in this case, this is... Uh, um, and it's also, even if you were to take it as uh, the third year of Cyrus, Cyrus counts his reign spring to spring. And so if you say in the first month, if you were counting according to the rain, it would still be uh, the first month in the spring, right? And, and we're, we're taking it that the Jews here in the book of Daniel, that Daniel is counting the reign of Cyrus as Cyrus would count it. So, you know, if we tried to move this earlier, we'd have another problem. So let's say we were going to move this and say, this is in 537 BC in the fall and that we're counting Cyrus's reign fall to fall, and that this first month is the 24th day of the seventh month, we would have difficulty with Ellen White's statements regarding uh, the space between the two decrees, which we're going to look at. So that is Cyrus's decree and Darius's decree. And it wouldn't really make sense to uh, place that there as well. So, So that's, you know, I mean, I could be wrong just because I, I think something doesn't mean it's right. But I think the arguments to try to place this is in the fall of 537 when Cyrus comes to the throne uh, doesn't really work out. Now, it would be nice in some ways because then we would have, uh, you know, the decree being issued in the fall rather than the spring. And that would be exactly 70 years from when Daniel was taken captive. But there's this six months delay. Cyrus comes to the throne within about two years from the fall of Babylon, because Darius, his uncle, dies, and we're going to look at who he is. And then uh, six months after that, he's going to issue this decree. So that's what Daniel 10 verse, Daniel 10 is about. It's about the issuing of this decree. Now, um, you know, that's a lot of, a lot of information. Let's let's go back, and this time we're going to look at Ezra. So we're going to look at the story here of these decrees as they are written in the book of Ezra. Now, Ezra compiled chronicles. Now, you'll notice the first two verses in the book of Ezra are the same as the last two verses in Second Chronicles. So Second Chronicles was compiled by Ezra. You. It's really just a continuation. Ezra and Nehemiah are just a continuation of Chronicles, but they're broken into these separate books. So, I mean, a person could just read them as one, one continuous um, collection of the history of the kings of Judah and Israel. The thing is with Chronicles, uh, we have the end of the kings of Judah. And so we now have this Ezra. And so that's why they call it the book of Ezra. Um, okay, so uh, H72. Okay, so I'm just looking at the note in the chat there by Angela. Um, H762104 oath is Daniel 9:11, and we use numerical symbols for the seventh day Sabbath. And 
and M. I don't know what M is in the Strong's numbers. What's M? M, M is midnight. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's seventh day Sabbath and midnight. So you have um I'm not sure what what you why seven two seven six one two what what is it you see in that number well because uh, you said you, you said that, that that that's at the seventh day they said it was seven six seven six seven six and i yeah. saw the seven six and the two one and that stood out to me okay yeah so you got the 21 there which which well is a symbol uh because 721 um becomes a symbol there for midnight, I guess. Um, okay. Yeah, and, and the word oath means to swear seven times, right? So that's why you use it seven times. Okay. So it says, just like in Second Chronicles, now the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. So we know that this 70 years is going to end with Cyrus. Now, I also should make a note here, just when it talks about the first year of a king. Now, we know that, that the kings of Judah, uh, the kings of Persia, the kings of Babylon, they have a thing called an accession year that is Let's say it's the 10th year of a king. You know, it's going to go from spring to spring. And he dies that summer and his son ascends to the throne or uh, succeeds to the throne, right? So they call that an accession year of this king, right? So the king's son is not, doesn't start his count. That year in which he is king is still the 10th year of his father's reign until the spring again at the Akitu festival. Uh, if you're in Babylon or Persia, you're then going to be placed upon the throne. So we're, we're going to look at that a little bit here. So uh, maybe I'll just show you an example of it. So we're going to Livius.org. Uh, so Livius.org is a, um, a scholarly place that has all of these ancient uh, tablets translated into English. And what we're looking at here is what's called ABC5, the Jerusalem Chronicle. So it's going to deal with Nebuchadnezzar the second. So that's Nebuchadnezzar as we know him. And um, it's going to deal with the, the capture of Jerusalem in 597 BC. Um, but I want to show here where Nebuchadnezzar becomes king of Babylon and how that occurs. So it says here in the 21st year, now they have 605 to 604. So the 21st year of the king of Akkad, that's Nabopolassar. He's the father of Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to stay in his own land. And Nebuchadnezzar, his eldest son, the crown prince, mustered the Babylonian army and took command of his troops. He marched to Carchemish, which is on the bank of the Euphrates. So Nebuchadnezzar's dad uh, is getting old. And previous to that, in ABC 4, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's army is actually going to join his father's army briefly uh, in another battle, and uh, that's the first time Nebuchadnezzar is mentioned in the Babylonian Chronicles. Now, he's the crown prince, so he's not the king of Babylon. So the, the Chronicles, you know, the Babylonian Chronicles are recording the activities of the military activities of the king of Babylon. But he's only mentioned earlier because he's joining his father. But Nebuchadnezzar has his own army as the crown prince, right? We talked about this in other studies, that this is a protection racket that Babylon ran. So they would go into a city, besiege it, um, just like 
the mafia would go to somebody's nightclub and say, you know, we're going to be protecting you from these other people who are going to do you harm if you just pay us money, right? And so that's what the king of Babylon does. Now, Nebuchadnezzar himself could also do this, just as the mafia leader's son could do some of those activities, so could Nebuchadnezzar. So it's my belief that in 607, he's going to actually do this with Jerusalem, with Jehoiakim, even though it's not recorded in the Babylonian Chronicles. And it's not recorded because it's not part of the record of the king of Babylon. But here, Nebuchadnezzar is being mentioned. First, because his his dad is staying home and also his father's going to die, right? So Nabopolassar reigns for 21 years. So in the 21st year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar takes this, the, the Babylonian army, he takes command of his father's troops and he marches to Carchemish and then he crossed the river to go <coughs> against the Egyptian army, which lay in Carchemish. And they fought each other, and the Egyptian army withdrew before him. He accomplished their defeat and beat them to non-existence, as for the rest of the Egyptian army, which had escaped from the defeat so quickly that no weapon had reached them in the district of Hamath. So uh, four years before, uh, there was a battle between Egypt and Assyria, in which Babylon was involved, and Assyria was defeated. That was in October of of 609 BC, but Egypt hadn't been defeated. And here, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is going to go against this battle against Egypt. And it's going to be in the same location as the battle was in 609. That's the battle in which Josiah, King Josiah dies. He doesn't really even get there. He gets killed early on fighting against Egypt. But anyway, um, so at that time, Nebuchadnezzar, this is line eight, uh, observe the whole area of Hamath. For 21 years, Nabopolassar had been king of Babylon, when on the 8th, 8th of Abu, he went to his destiny in the month of Ululu, Nebuchadnezzar returned to Babylon. So Av, that's the fifth month. So this is the 8th of Av. It's the 8th day of the fifth month. Nabopolassar dies. So he went to his destiny. That's what that means. And in the month of Ulu, Ululu, that's the sixth month, uh, Nebuchadnezzar returns to Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar, um, even though Babylon and Jerusalem are pretty far away, um, you can travel quickly. They would have messengers and ways to send messages. Um, so, but, so it's going to be in the sixth month that he's going to sit on the royal throne in Babylon. So in the accession year, it says, of Nebuchadnezzar, in this accession year, Nebuchadnezzar went back to the Hatti land until the month of Sabatu. So Sabatu's uh, the 10th month, right? That's um, going to be usually around, uh, so it's early 604, it says here. And uh, they got these notes, 7th, 7th of September, 605, he's going to sit on the throne. And then it's going to be August 15th, 605, that uh, um, Nabopolassar dies. Kind of an interesting date there. That's the symbol for the midnight cry. Um, so he's going to die on that date. It's going to be the 8th of Av, August 15th, 605. And so then on September 7th, 605, Nebuchadnezzar is now sitting on the throne in Babylon. And, and this is says in the accession year. So even though he's sitting on the throne of Babylon in the sixth month, it's still his accession year. So he goes back to Palestine. Now, when it talks about the Hattie land, that includes Syria and Palestine. That's the Levant, that whole area. Um, between the Mediterranean and the Euphrates. Uh, so he says he marched unopposed through the Hattie land. In the month of Sabatu, he took heavy tribute of the Hattie territory to Babylon. And in the month of Nisanu, so that's the spring of 604, he took the hands of Bel, 
the son of Bel, and celebrated the Ikitu festival. In the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, in the month of Samanu, he mustered his army. So it's going to talk about later. So in 604, that's at the Akitu festival. That's when he officially becomes the king. It's no longer his accession year. So, so when it says in the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, notice that's going to be 604 to 603. Now, um, will this paper be sent in the email? What paper? This is not a paper. So you want to know what this link is? Um, yeah. Okay, I'll just put it here in, in sharing it. Oh, this is, oh, you got it, oh, you got it on a uh, website, right? Yeah, this is a website. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so this is just livius.org. It's ABC5. So, okay. Yeah. So I just okay, put it in the chat. Yeah, so this is easily accessible to anybody. Um, livius, L-I-V-I-U-S, dot org. And they, you can just look up the Jerusalem Chronicle or you can look up ABC, you know, okay. if, but there's ABC four. They have them numbered. Um, Assyrian and Babylonian Chronicles, I think, is what ABC stands for. Because um, they deal with Assyria and Babylon. <clears throat> so, um or it could be ancient Babylonian Chronicles. I'm not sure what ABC stands for, but that's that's what they have as a symbol for those. So anyway, you can you can see that you know, we have these records. We can date them, um, so we know when these events occurred. Now, often what modern scholarship does is they don't believe the Bible. So since they don't believe the Bible, um, and the Bible talks about seventy years. They're going to take this story here and say, this is when Daniel was taken captive. Right. So they're going to say it's in 604 B.C. In the month of Sab Sabatu, or maybe it's this because he's going to be because um, he's going to go to the Hatti land. Right. So that's Palestine. So maybe that's Jerusalem. But right? they're guessing. And it's early in 604. And they're saying. Well, that's when Daniel's taken captive in 604, right? And then they say, well, the 70 years aren't really 70 years. That's just a, a symbolic number. So, you know, when Babylon falls in 609, some of them will have, you know, Cyrus in 607 or 606. And they're going to say, well, it's 68 years in reality, but it's the Bible calls it 70 years. Um. And so they don't have Daniel taken captive. They have a whole messed up chronology of the Babylonian captivity that doesn't work. It contradicts itself. Well, because they don't believe the Bible anyway. So it doesn't really matter. They can have all these contradictions. But as somebody who believes the Bible, we can't do that. So anyway, this is just an example of this accession year. <clears throat> so I didn't really want to go into that too much dealing with all of that history. But when we go back to then, um, you know, Cyrus, so the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, we're saying that this is now the first year of Cyrus, just as we have the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, is in the spring. So Daniel is counting this as well as Ezra. They're going to count it spring to spring. Now, we know that in places, Ezra is going to use a fall to fall count, as well as Nehemiah, for the king of Persia. Right. So so that can confuse people. But, but we'll address those points as we come to them, why that is. But here he's talking about the first year of Cyrus as Cyrus understands it. And it's going to be in the first month. Right. That, that that Daniel is going to be praying, and that's when the decree is going to be issued. So this proclamation here is the 26th day of the fourth month, or the first month, 20, 24th day of the first month. I think I got that right. Because that's when Daniel is vi visited by the angel Gabriel and Christ 
to say that they won this victory over the mind of Cyrus. And so Cyrus issues this decree. Now, let's go to Daniel chapter 1. Um, now, Daniel chapter 1, we know that Daniel's taken to Babylon under um, Nebuchadnezzar, right? And then from Daniel chapter 1, it's going to go through and talk about the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, which is his actual second year. Nebuchadnezzar is not actually the king of Babylon when he takes Daniel captive because he doesn't become the king of Babylon until the summer of 605, right, when his dad dies. That's going to be August 15th, 605 BC, his dad dies. And then on September 7th, he's going to be in Babylon, sitting upon the throne. And then he's going to become king, technically. His first year begins in the spring of 604. So when Daniel's taken captain, captive, even though... He talks about the king, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. This is written after, after Babylon has fallen. Daniel is going to write this account of his history later on. And so he's going to refer to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. You can talk about uh, Obama, the president of the United States before he was the president of the United States, right? You can refer to him proleptically as the president, same with Trump or any of the presidents. You can talk about their life. Abraham Lincoln, you know, who was the president of the United States when he was a child. You can still refer to him in that story as, you know, President Lincoln, if you want to, but you know he wasn't a president when he was a child, when he cut down the cherry tree. Well, that's not E. Lincoln. That's Abraham. Yeah, that's Abraham Lincoln who cut down the cherry tree. Is that George Washington? That's George Washington who cut down the cherry tree, right? Okay, whoever it was. <laughs> um, I'm Canadian, not American. So um, anyway, the point is that Nebuchadnezzar is not the king of Babylon when Daniel's taken captive. But he's going to be brought to Babylon and we know that he's going to be educated for two years or, or how long is it that they say? Um, and Isn't it three years? Three years. Yes. So three years, pardon me. And, and then it's going to be in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel would be killed, right? If along with these other Chaldeans and astrologers and all that, because they can't interpret the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. So since this is the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, this would be in beginning in 603 BC. And if and if Daniel had just been taken captive in the first year. You couldn't, you couldn't have him part of this decree until after he becomes a Chaldean, right? He wouldn't be involved in this. So, so this obviously has to be Daniel was taken captive in 607, not in early 604, and then one year later, three years have already passed, right? So I'm not, I'm not going to go into it in detail, but just that would be the part of the problems. Now, we also have in Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar. Now, Belshazzar is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, he's not the king in, that is, the one who's the king is Nabonidus. Nabonidus is not the direct descendant of Nebuchadnezzar, right? He's, he's married to a descendant of Nebuchadnezzar one of Nebuchadnezzar's granddaughters. Um, but Nabonidus is the king. And, and why is Nebuchadnezzar not the king? Why is Nebuchadnezzar second in command, even though he's the grandson 
of Nebu or why is Belshazzar the second command, even though he's the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar? Because his father was not then in Babylon. Okay, well, his father's dead, but but Bel but Belshazzar, who's the no. grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, right? Nebuchadnezzar's been dead for you know since uh, 1561. So Edel Merodach was made king. Belshazzar was never made the first king in Babylon. Evil Merodach, Evil Merodach was not in Babylon at that time. Okay, but that's not answering the question. Belshazzar never becomes the king of Babylon, the, the first king. He's only the second in command. He's He's been around for, for a long time. He was alive when, because Ellen White says, he saw Nebuchadnezzar when Nebuchadnezzar went insane. He was a child then when his grandfather uh, was made insane for seven years. So why is he not made king of Babylon? Why is Belshazzar not king of Babylon? Why is he? I mean, it says Belshazzar, king of Babylon, but he's not the main king because when he offers Daniel that he could be made the third ruler in the kingdom. So Belshazzar is the second in command. Nabonidus is actually the king. And Belshazzar is the acting king in that Nabonidus is a monk. Right. So Nabonidus isn't even acting as the king, even though he's technically the king. So, so why is Belshazzar not the first in command? Then anybody know the answer to that? I think Stephen would know the answer if he was here, but okay. Go on. Wouldn't it be? Would, wouldn't it be because Nebuchadnezzar was still living? No, nope. Nebuchadnezzar died a uh, long, long time before. So, so, so one of the things here, the reason why I bring up these points is that modern scholarship believes that. Um, that this is all made up that they just they made up this story and this story is going to be written the book of Daniel according to modern scholarship is just a pseudepigraphic writing that is falsely attributed to somebody named Daniel from the past and that they're going to make up this whole story about who Daniel was and and Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar these are just made up Darius the Mede is just made up. And they, they, they took names from the past and they just made up these stories and placed these names here. And for a long time, scholarship never even believed that Belshazzar existed until they found the documents that show that Belshazzar is indeed the second in command in Babylon when Babylon fell. So... So once they found the documents, they found, oh, you know, the book of Daniel was correct here. Now, part of the problem, if you believe that the book of Daniel was written in the second century BC, how come the book of Daniel has details that nobody knows about through that whole Persian period and then aren't revealed until modern archaeology digs up some tablets with his name on it? See, it's a problem that the critics of the Bible have is that archaeology keeps showing that the Bible is correct. And uh, so, you know, this, this idea that Belshazzar is just made up uh, doesn't really fit um, archaeology. It shows that he is, but it definitely shows that modern scholarship is at fault. So, so we have Belshar as the second in command, something that's clearly in the Bible, and, and he's not even a character in history. That is, Belshazzar is not recorded in history. He's only recorded in the Bible and found in archaeology. That is, we can find archaeological accounts or archaeological digs that have, you know, contemporary accounts showing Bel Belshazzar's existence. Now, so Nabopolassar, 
the father of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, it's We're not quite sure, because some of this has to be reconstructed, but Nebuchadnezzar would have married Adad Gubi. And um, it's a very strange name, but that's her name. And she's going to be the mother of Nitocris or Nitocris. And Nitocris is going to be the mother of Belshazzar. So Belshazzar, uh, his mother marries Nabonidus. So Nabonidus, so the, the thing is, in the Babylonian system, the what do they call that when you have the, the person who's qualified to become king that that's the order of accession or something like that. So there's, there's a way in which you're going to decide who's going to be the ruler. And that is the direct descendant of Nebuchadnezzar. That is his daughter. She becomes queen and whoever she marries becomes king. Until she dies and her husband dies, then her son doesn't become king. So you would think the son would just become king. But since the mother is alive, the mother is going to be queen and her husband will be king. So Nabonidus most likely is married to Nicris, Nitocris or Nitocris however you say her name, and that's why he's the king. So Belshazzar, as the son of Nicritus, Nit Nitocris, and uh, Nabonidus, he's the grandson, so he's the second in command. He would become king if his mother and father died. But all during this period, Belshazzar, as the son of Nitocris, He's going to be a co-regent with um, Nergalisar, who's married to another daughter of Nebuchadnezzar called Kasaya. And then when Nergalisar, he's the descendant of Evil Merodach. So Evil Merodach um, <coughs> is, um, and, and we're not certain about this. So anyway, the point is, Belshazzar's just not in line to become the king of Babylon yet. So if Nabonidus had died, it seems that likely he would become king or if his mother died. So, so it's just not well known. But from Nebuchadnezzar, the kings are Evil Merodach, Nereglisser, Labasa, Labasi Marduk, and then Nabonidus. So there's actually four kings of Babylon after Nebuchadnezzar. But Belshazzar, who's the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, he is still around. He's, get, he's getting older, but he's still not the king. He's only co-reigning in 559. He co-reigns with Nergliser. And then in 556, he's co-reigning with Labasi Marduk. And in 556, because Labasi Marduk is only a king for a short time, he then co-reigns with Nabonidus. And so we're not really sure why, but we know that he's the second in command. He's not going to be the king. But here he's described as being Belshazzar king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords. So he's the one who's actually practically king in the sense that Nabonidus is just a monk. He's only concerned with religious duties, not civil duties. Okay. And it's probably Natokris who actually comes in um, and uh, talks to Belshazzar when he um, wants to have this stuff interpreted. And she points him to Daniel. Right. So it says now the queen, by reason of the words of the king of his lords. So this wouldn't be Belshazzar's wife. This would be his mother. Right. So she's going to say, you know about Daniel. And, and so she would be the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. Right. And the mother of Belshazzar. So when it says um, Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say thy father. 
Here, it's not talking about him and father in the sense that we would. That would be just, they didn't, they called the grandfather the father too. So Nebuchadnezzar, thy grandfather, the king. So there's these criticisms about this, this text of Daniel that if we understand the history correctly, we can see that these aren't contradictions or problems. But modern scholarship, even though these have all been refuted, in the past as objections to the book of Daniel being written by who it's claimed to be written. Um, even though these have been refuted, they still hold on to these things. Okay. So comment there. Okay. So I can give you a copy of this. So, and, and this is just a suggestion. This isn't the, this chart here. I'm going to post, see if I can post this. I don't know if it will work. Yeah, there it is. So this chart here is just a suggestion. Um, there's disagreements regarding how to interpret uh, these kings, but there, there's the chart that I was looking at. I made this chart. Some people have different um, ways in which they try to reconstruct this. But the point is, um, Belshazzar is the son of, of Nitocris, who's the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar and Adad Gupi, right? So he's the grandson. And these other kings here, he has these co regencies with. So. Hopefully that's helpful, that chart there. <clears throat> so let's go back to uh, Ezra. So hopefully this, even though it's a little bit scattered how I'm presenting it, we can start to see that when Cyrus comes to the throne, um, he's going to come to the throne as the king of Persia. And we're going to learn a little bit more about this. So. Um, let's go, let's go to Daniel chapter four again, actually. So, so in this dream, right, which is going to be interpreted by Daniel, it's going to say, um, where's this here? No, I'm chapter five. Why did I go to chapter four? Handwriting on the wall. Here's where we're supposed to be. So it says in verse Chapter 5, verse 31, it says, And Darius the Median, that is, he's the Median king, king of Media, took the kingdom being about three score and two years old. So he's 62 years old, and Cyrus, his nephew, is the one who conquers Babylon, right? So he's going to be the one, according to Isaiah, out. Uh, uh, Open before him the two leaved gates, and the gate shall not be shut. So Cyrus is going to be the one who actually goes in and conquers Babylon. Now, if you were to have the book of Daniel written in the second century BC, based on the information that people had at that time, the book of Daniel would make no sense. Um, you wouldn't have Darius the Mede, because nobody knows of Darius the Mede you would try to make a story that would be more believable. Now, the question is, who is Darius the Mede? Now, there is a paper which um, uh, which is one of the main papers that I use because the guy does a very good job. And I'm going to show you this here. You can find this online quite easily, but I, I should send this in an email. So this is by Stephen D. Anderson. Now he's going to do this, his, his um, uh, dissertation from the Dallas Theological Seminary. Let me just blow this up a little bit. And there we go. Uh, it's written in 2014. And he did a correction of April 2015. So it's pretty modern. But this guy is believes in the Bible. 
and and he writes about this um what his beliefs are and that that he's not following modern scholarship because if he was following modern scholarship he would have to be critical of the bible but he believes in the bible and so he's going to show that uh that that the one who's referred to as Darius the Mede is actually uh, a king called Cyaxares the Second, and he's basing this upon Xenophon. Now, Xenophon is a histor historian who's you probably heard of Herodotus. Herodotus, uh, Herodotus, however you say his name, that's this guy here. So this is basically the, the two main historians that people depend upon to know the history of Medo-Persia. Now, Herodotus wrote about 60 years before Xenophon, and, but Herodotus's writings are quite different in character than Xenophon. So one is Herodotus is collecting all kinds of stories, stories that contradict each other, um, He's sort of a popular writer. Um, so he's, and, and he's not very reliable. And there's a scholarly debate about how reliable he is in history. Obviously, some histories that he's a part of, he would be more reliable in. Um, so they're writing in like the 4th century BC, 4th and 5th centuries BC. So Xenophon gives an account that agrees with the scriptures. For that reason, Xenophon's account is discredited. Herodotus contradicts the scriptures, so his is the one that scholars depend upon more. Does that make sense? Doesn't really make much sense, does it? Except if you understand modern scholarship, its main goal is to show that the Bible is faulty, right? So anything that can contradict the scriptures will be considered accurate, even if it has no real support for it. And anything that agrees with the scriptures will then just be seen as being a source from which the scriptures then derived their story, right? So, so the fact that Xenophon is going to, he doesn't say that that Darius the Mede is uh, Cyaxares. He just talks about him and what happens, that he's the uncle of Cyrus and that he's going to be 62 years old uh, um, at the time of the fall of Babylon, right? Or something like that. So he's going to agree with what the Bible says. And so... They're going to say, well, that's just where the Bible got this story from. Um, they got it from Xenophon, not Herodotus. Now, if Herodotus had written something accurate, he agreed with the Bible, and Xenophon contradicted it, they would have probably accepted Xenophon's explanation and rejected Herodotus's. So this Cyaxares II, um, was the actual head of the government while Cyrus led the Medo Persian armies on campaigns of conquest. Herodotus, on the other hand, claims that Cyrus overthrew the previous Median king, Astyges, in a coup and recognizes no further Median kings. So that is, Herodotus has the father of Cyaxares as being the one that Cyrus overthrows, and he doesn't mention, he doesn't mention. Cyaxares, right? Um, so he says here, this writer, um, Stephen Anderson, a preliminary analysis finds that Xenophon's story is more credible than Herodotus, right? So, so that's what this is based upon. So it's, it's a very good paper. Um, it's very good scholarship. Uh, he supports the Bible. Um, and in this paper, he also, also says that uh, Cyrus succeeds to the throne within about two years of the fall of Babylon, exactly the same words that Ellen White uses to describe um, 
Cyrus coming to the throne when Darius dies. So he has Darius dying within about two years of the fall of Babylon. So that within about two years is, is quite precise. So that means it's less than two years, but it's about two years. So it's within and it's about. And, and so that's why we have uh, the 70 years ending in the fall of 537 BC within about two years from when Babylon fell in October 13th, 539. And then it's going to be six months later that the decree is going to be issued. So he says here, uh, just interesting point about his perspective. This book is written explicitly from a biblical Christian worldview, a true rarity for an academic study in 2014, since the market for such writing has virtually evaporated. Mainstream scholarship has become thoroughly secular. Mainstream evangelical Christian scholarship has moved so close to mainstream secular academia that it also dislikes writing from a biblical Christian worldview in academic publications. And traditional fundamental Christian groups have generally retreated from academia to the point where they no longer produce top level academic works. This book is no diatribe. It is a careful historical study, which is written from a biblical Christian rather than a secular point of view. Does that make it biased? Only if bias is defined subjectively as stating as fact, without supporting arguments, something that is not held as fact by the majority of current mainstream scholarship. It may be noted, however, that since scholarly opinion is always changing, there would have been times when writing from a biblical Christian worldview was considered unbiased in academia during the 17th, 18th, and parts, parts of the 19th centuries, for example. If one wishes to read a version of this book that would be considered largely without bias by contemporary academic standards, he may read the author's May 2004 PhD dissertation from Dallas Theological Seminary, which was written and edited according to the contemporary requirements of that institution. So he did write a version of this that is, you know, meets those requirements of academia. So to be sort of objective as they would call it but he doesn't believe that that's that's really the truth right so he he says i'm writing this from a biblical perspective and so so it, it's a good it's a good paper to read if you want more background on darius the need <clears throat> So we know there's two different Darius's, right? And that confuses people. Um, we have Darius the Mede and uh, Darius um, the Persian or Darius the Great. Now I just have a chart here, which I'm gonna look at. Uh, to fix this. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, so this chart here is um, it's not showing up. Just hang on. Okay, this has some spirit of prophecy statements on it, and it's going to deal with with all this history, the fall of Babylon. Uh, I'm not sure if this is lining up. So this would be, I had to fix some of this, so it's not right. There we go. Should be correct. Should go there. 
I don't know where this goes. Okay. Ah, there this goes here. Okay, I'm going to zoom into this and you'll see what I'm talking about. So here we have the fall of Babylon, October 12th to 13th, uh, 539. So it'd actually be uh, the night of October 12th and the morning of October 13th. So I guess technically from sunset, October 13th. But usually uh, the date that's given would be marked as October 12th. That's when this, this begins, this fall of Babylon, but it's going to end in the nighttime. So it's going to end on October 13th. Okay, so that's 539. And then within about two years, Cyrus' succession to the throne, Ellen White marks as the 70 years are complete. Then Cyrus's decree I put after April 23rd. So I, mean, I could just put April 24th. Probably it's just a little more clear. The exiles rebuild the altar September 4th, and then the te temple construction starts May 18th. I'm not sure about those dates. I'd have to recheck them because I wrote this a long time ago. So Ellen White says, um, <clears throat> Daniel's prayer had been offered in the first year of Darius. Verse 1, the Median monarch whose general Cyrus had wrested from Babylonia the scepter of universal rule. The reign of Darius was honored of God. To him was sent the angel Gabriel to confirm and strengthen him. Daniel 11 verse 1. Upon his death, within about two years of the fall of Babylon, Cyrus succeeded to the throne, and the beginning of his reign um, marked the completion of the 70 years since the first company of Hebrew Hebrews had been taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar from their Judean home to Babylon. So, so we know when Darius died. It's within about two years of the fall of Babylon, since Babylon fell in the fall of 539. That's going to be in the fall of 537. And Ellen White marks that as the completion of the 70 years since the first company of Hebrews. That would include Daniel in the third year of Jehoiakim had been taken by Nebuchadnezzar from their Judean home. So to me, this statement is pretty unequivocal. Uh, we can say where the 70 years began and ended. And, um, you know, this is agreed upon in this book here. I'm just going to find it. Uh, this is so hard to work with this new program. I don't know how to search this. Um, yeah. So I don't know how to search this new PDF Acrobat reader that I have. Huh. Must be some way to search. Oh, here it is. Just moved it over. Sorry about this. Okay, so here is a statement in this other paper. Uh, the thesis of this study is that Cyrus shared power with the Median king until about two years after the fall of Babylon. So you can see that he said agrees with uh, the spirit of prophecy. Just see, um, and again he says this. 
Uh, the primary historical issue in this study is whether Cyrus deposed the Median king, Astyages, Astyages in whatever, 565, 55 BC, well before the fall of Babylon, or whether he inherited the position of the Median king, Cyaxares II, or Darius the Mede, uh, circa 537 BC, about two years after the fall of Babylon. Um, so he has until approximately two years after the fall of Babylon. So it's almost identical to Ellen White's statement. Um, it's just more about him being 62 years. Um, so again, about two years after the fall of Babylon, he was co-regent with Cyrus. Okay. <clears throat> so hopefully that, that's helpful, just some of that background. I know it's kind of tedious detail, but when it says Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about three, three score and two years old, so that's 62, uh, we know that it's Cyrus who did this, right, according to Isaiah. And so if you were going to write a counterfeit document, would you put Darius the Mede in there instead of Cyrus? Right? Could you imagine somebody in the second century BC creating counterfeit doc document and putting details that couldn't be confirmed because he wouldn't have known about them until, you know, couple of thousand years later it wouldn't make any sense so these criticisms of the skeptics are actually evidences that the bible and the book of daniel was written by daniel right daniel wrote the book of daniel because he has details only daniel would know and that you wouldn't have known in the second century bc right That makes sense to people? Did I put everyone to sleep with all that? Yes, I think it yeah. Okay. Yeah, so so we can see then um, uh, we're going to have Darius. Now I'm going to go to some of these charts. This might help you a little bit. Uh, well, let's, let's finish looking at this one chart that we were looking at. And just some more of Ellen White's statements. So the next one is from Review and Herald, January 23rd, 1908. The 70 years captivity dated from the time when the Babylonian kings began to hold universal sway. God gave Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, much majesty, glory, and honor. All people, nations, and language, languages trembled in fear before him. So she says, begins, that is the 70 years captivity, uh, dated from the time when the Babylonian kings began to hold universal sway. So they began to hold universal sway in 609, um, but the captivity itself began in 607. So I put that there in brackets in that quote. Um, and then from the same article, the same universal sway was exercised by Nebuchadnezzar descendants until nearly 70 years later. So that would be the fall of 539. In the days of Belshazzar, because of the wickedness of the nation, the kingdom was divided and given to the Medes of the Persians. The, thus arose the second universal monarchy, Medo-Persia. So you can see here, Ellen White is supporting this idea because she doesn't say, 70 years later, she says nearly 70 years later. So we can agree that 68 years is nearly 70 years. Right. And if, and if you look at the context, it's, it, it, it's even clearer. So she says it was only about two years afterward that Cyrus, king of Medo-Persia, issued the remarkable decree providing the restoration of all the Israelites. Now here she doesn't say within about two years. It was about two years after. So it's two and a half years, about two years. Yeah. Okay. And then she's going to talk about the decrees themselves, the first and the second decree. 
So she says, a score or more of years past. Now, a score is 20, right? And, and that's going to be since the first decree. When a second decree, quite as favorable as the first, was issued by Darius Hystaspes, the monarch then ruling. Thus did God in mercy provide another opportunity for the Jews in the Medo-Persian realm to return to the land of their fathers. The Lord foresaw the troublous times that would follow during the reign of Xerxes, the Ahasuerus of the book of Esther. He not only wrought a change of feeling in the hearts of, the, of, in the hearts of those in authority, but also inspired Zechariah to plead with the exiles to return. And then she has another statement, Review and Herald, January 23rd, 1908. Nearly 20 years passed since the first decree. Many of the remnant who returned to Judea had fallen into a backsliding condition and were doing no more to restore the house of God than um, were their brethren living elsewhere in the Medo-Persian realm. But as a result of the appeals of Haggai and Zechariah, the returned exiles repented before God and labored diligently to complete the temple. The Lord blessed them and they were greatly prospered. Their efforts were brought to the notice of Darius Astaspes, who was the monarch ruling at the time. And he was impressed to issue a second degree, favor fully as favorable as the one issued by Cyrus over 20 years before. So that means Cyrus's decree was issued more than 20 years before Darius's decree. So Cyrus's decree is issued in the spring of 537. The earliest that you could have Darius's decree is in the spring, but since it's more, probably the summer of 517 or 516, pardon me. So I'm getting this all mixed up. So 536. So in the spring of 536, I said 537. So it's in the spring of 536. So the earliest would be the spring of 516, but more likely the summer of 516. So I have here 20 years or more. So this goes from 536. It's going to be the spring. These years here are our years on our calendar. So I'm going to have the spring there as, you know, partly through 536. So that's going to be three months into 536. It's actually four months, April 23rd or whatever, 24th. And then you're going to have uh, 20 years or more. And then Darius's decree is going to be issued in the summer of 516. And then about six, seven months later, the temple will be completed. And we're going to address that in more detail when we get into Darius's reign. So this house helps us establish uh, this history of Cyrus. Okay. So hopefully that's not too tedious for people because these are important points in establishing this history. We have Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Great. They're going to be the Meda Persian kings. They're going to be the ones it's going to be the fall of Babylon, which Cyrus is a part of, but it's under Darius the Mede that Babylon is going to fall. And we say that that's a parallel with Ronald Reagan. And then we have Cyrus uh, issuing a decree that's going to end, um, really, it's going to end that 70 years being a period of 70 years and six months, but it's going to be connected to that end in that even though when he comes to the throne, it marks the completion of 70 years, it's still going to take six more months until he issues a decree for them to return to Jerusalem. And then um, uh, they're going to return to Jerusalem um, on September 4th, right? So the exiles return and build the altar on September 4th. And then the temple construction starts May 18th. Now, since I did this a long time ago, I'm just going to check some of these dates. So if I go here, so let's just check what I have here. So this is the um, calendar converter. So if we go to 536 and we go to the first month, 
the 24th day. So actually that April 23rd I had there was correct. So I must have updated this. So April 23rd is the 24th day of the first month. So I just corrected it on that chart. Okay. Now, um, oops. Let's do this again. 536 April 23rd. Okay. Right, so you see I'm using this date down here. This is the Gregorian date. This is the Julian date. Nissan 24 is April 23rd, okay? And then we're gonna put the next date. So the next date's gonna be, um, and I just wanna note here, that notice the Babylonian calendar. It doesn't have any dates in this. I'm not, right? So the Babylonian calendar is not uh, marking dates here. So that's because it's uh, not inside the chart or the table of dates that they have. But it should be. It should be within the table of dates they have. Because this goes all the way back to 6. See, if I go 592, let me see. See, this one's going to show this, 592. So I'm not sure. Okay, let me go here. Just not sure why the 536 isn't showing up. Because this should go all the way up to, unless we didn't put all the dates in there. Yep, so I don't know why it wasn't showing the date. It should. Okay. So let's go back 536. It's showing up now. Not sure why it wasn't showing up before. Okay, so let's go back here. Um, so Nissan 24. Uh, we don't want Nissan 24, 537. We don't want to go to 536. There we go. So you can see April 23rd, Nissan 24. There we go. So it's going to be the same on the Babylonian calendar. 24th day of Nisanu, right? It's the third year of Cyrus. So notice here, this program is counting the third year of Cyrus from the fall of Babylon. It doesn't actually put Darius in here at all, okay? Because it's going to use the kings of Babylon. <clears throat> okay, so, and then we're going to go to the seventh month. And we have to go to the first day of the seventh month. So here, I have September 24th and on the Babylonian, it, it would be September 25th. So for some reason I had September 4th, it should be September 24th if we're using the Babylonian or the biblical calendar. And then the temple construction starts on the second day of the second month. So that's going to be in the next year. And um, so the second day of the second month is I have May 20th. Is it the second day of the second month that the temple foundation of the temple is laid. So I'd have to go back and look. Yeah, I know that the second day of the second month is, I think, when the, the foundation of Solomon's temple was laid. So I think I just put the second month. So I put May 19th, but it should be May 18th or 19th. I'm not sure. So not sure about those dates. Uh, I'm going to change it to May 19th on the chart. 
But you can see that this is this period of time in which Cyrus's decree goes into effect. So we have all these different dates lining up. Okay. Any questions about that? I don't know if I confused people or if I actually helped you. <clears throat> Here again, I'll have to look and then come back. Okay. Yeah, so we have the fall of Babylon, October 12th to 13th, 539, within about two years, Cyrus succeeds to the throne. Ellen White says that marks the completion of the 70 years from when the first Hebrew captives, which would include Daniel, were carried away to Babylon. And so then Cyrus's decree is issued about six months later, in April 23rd, 536. The exiles return, build the altar, September 24th. And then the temple construction begins the following spring in the second month. And I don't think it's the second day. I think it's just the second month is what they give. So they don't give a date. I could be wrong. Um, so that's in 535. And, and she makes the statement that it's nearly 20 years from when they return to Babylon to when Darius's decree is issued. So we know that it's it's more than 20 years from when Cyrus's decree is issued to Darius's, but less than 20 from when the exiles return and Darius's decree is issued. So that, that places Darius's decree in the summer of 516. It, it can't be in the fall of 516. It can't be earlier than the spring. And then it takes about six, seven months until it's completed in the spring of 515 and the dedication occurs. So it's, it's kind of a condensed version of this without going into detail. <clears throat> now, what we're going to do next week is we'll start drawing these things on a line and put the time at the end and, and so forth. Now, that means we can take uh, Cyrus's history, and we can mark it as a separate line. It's the first way mark on the line of the decrees, and maybe we can draw those out as well. But we're going to say that Cyrus's line itself, um, Cyrus's history itself, is a line. And, and you should be able to see that some of this is occurring here. We're going to have symbols that are addressed here that we can take Cyrus's decree and place it on a line. We can do that with Darius's decree. We can do that with Artaxerxes' decree. And if we place it on a line, you know, we'll have a time at the end. We'll have an increase of knowledge. We'll have uh, an empowerment of the first message, its formalization, an arrival of a second message. And, and again, it's going to have a formalization and empowerment and then there should be the arrival of a third message. And we'll see how Cyrus's history fits that perfectly, that we can easily draw this on a line uh, that would line up with Millerite history. And then we'll do the same with Darius. Right? So Darius has a line as well. That's going to be Haggai and Zechariah that we're going to be studying uh, to put that line of Darius and Zechariah. And we studied that in Dwight's studies on Sabbath morning. Right. We already looked at that history. Um, now, we are going to look at the what I would call the empowerment of the second angel's message, which is the story of Esther. And that's going to be a line which we've already addressed. But we're going to look at that one again and why that history is where it is in these lines of the decrees. And then we're going to look at Artaxerxes' decree. So that's going to be over the next few weeks, I would assume. So we're going to get this all established the kings of Media and Persia and all this history. And then we can start looking at Daniel chapter 11 and understand what's happening in that history. Why, how those verses, how that history parallels our own, right? So we got this preliminary work. Hopefully it doesn't take us too long, but based on past record, it'll probably take us a while, okay? So um, 
Can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today. I know it's tedious for many minds, but we ask, Lord, that we can clearly understand the rise of Cyrus and the fall of Babylon. And that we can see in this history how it relates to the present. Um, give us wisdom and understanding as we continue to study these things on our own. And continue to bless um, each person searching for truth. Thank you for the Sabbath that will be coming tomorrow evening and the studies there. And um, the studies on Sabbath. And guide and direct. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>